I talked to Michelle Anderson briefly before coming in. Uh, we, every year, twice a year, actually, we serve at the banquet. And this year, we're going to do that again on Saturday, April 7th. We need three things, caring people, cakes, and cash. So we need, I like the three C's. We need um, about 45 people to serve uh, cakes and, and cash. If you can provide any of those services, there's a table on the way out. We will be uh, finishing up our series over the next two Sundays, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Palm Sunday, we'll talk about Jesus being like-minded, and then Easter Sunday, him being heavenly-minded. We'll also meet Good Friday. We did a message from a series called Crosstalk. Uh, we did that several years back, in which we looked at Jesus' words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we understood that those are the words from a Jewish song. And we'll look at the significance of what Jesus was saying when he said that. A message called Not Forsaken, because he was not. And we'll explore that together. I'll give you an update. Um, many of you are aware that O'Gorman will be building. We found out we have a team put together to try to identify another site. One of the team members met with the administration of O'Gorman. We learned that in May 2008, that we will, they will begin to build on this site. And so we will need to find another site to meet in. Um, so we have a year to identify another site. We're doing a couple of things. In fact, two of them were already accomplished. We met with the individuals who were responsible for coordinating ministries and found out what type of space you need. The second thing we've already done is formed a team. And now the third thing, we'll identify some sites, find out some possible places. We learned that the church... the the church that is using the middle school, they are breaking ground. They will be in their facility, so there's the possibility that we could meet at the middle school right next door. We don't know if that's the best option for us, but we'll, we'll keep you updated. Today we'll talk about the mind of Christ, you know, in the history of religion. There have been several things that seem to be commonly held premises in terms of the history of religion in the world. Number one, that God is superior and threatening, somewhat distant. The second is that the sphere of the holy is separated from the sphere of the not holy. And so there's a clear line between those things that belong to the sacred sphere and those things that do not belong to the sacred sphere. That seems to be something that religions have in common as well. And the third thing is that eliminating the threat from God requires doing things for God. Uh, again, God is distant, somewhat threatening, holy, and therefore... In the history of religion, there have been things that people have done to try to eliminate the threat from God, things that they felt that God would be pleased with. And it could be anything from what Muslims and Jews have done and still do, which is ritual washings. And what they believe is that when you are in the world and you come into contact with people, you become unclean. You might touch things that are not holy things. And so, in many religions, when they are preparing to do something for God, they wash themselves very carefully. And again, Muslims do that daily, a ritual washing. Uh, it can be something more mild or something more extreme. I talked about a movie about the Mayans, Apocalypto. I was in Belize, Central America, and saw these ruins, and know that what the Mayans did, they felt that when there was like a drought, it was because the gods were angry. And in order to eliminate the threat from these gods, what they did was they would do human sacrifices, and do human sacrifices until what they were trying to Change changed. Jesus Christ, when he came, shattered all these religious ground rules. 
And when we look at God is superior and threatening, um, Jesus indicates that he is God the Son and he became an infant. And so what we have then in Jesus, God cutting wood, taking a nap and weeping at funerals. God who picks up children and blesses them. And he really changed the whole sense then of the commonly held religious notions. God is distant, threatening, remote. And what Jesus indicates to us, uh, no, he isn't. The sphere of the holy is separated from the sphere of the not holy. Um, Jesus changed that as well. Again, God moving into human skin. God who knows what it's like to have a stomach ache and to go to the bathroom. Again, with what Jesus tells us then, he really, really revolutionizes our whole thinking about what God is like and overturns commonly held notions. A God who embraces the oppressed, the lowly, and the sick. The need to do things for God, to turn him from his anger. What we have is a God who provides blood so that those who are distant from him can have life. And again, we talked about when we think about sacrifices. The Jews had sacrifices. So what they were taught is that an animal had to die in order to cover over sin because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And what we saw is that it's possible to get a picture in our mind of that animal being punished. So we did something wrong. The animal gets its throat cut. It's, it's punished in our place. That's not the picture. We talked a couple of weeks ago that there's life in the blood, not death. For a Jew, now, there's life in the blood. And what that means then, the offering of a sacrifice is the pouring out of a life. The altar at which the animal is sacrificed is not a place of punishment. That's not for a Jew. It's not what their thinking would have been. It's a place where a gift is offered. And the life is in the blood. The blood of the animal then is a gift from the Father enabling those who need it to have life. And that makes more sense of Jesus when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what he's talking about, these being sources of immortal life. And that's why we say, that's how you have eternal life. Eternal life is in Jesus. He pours out his life. It's not the Father beating the Son to avert his anger. It's the Father giving the Son. The Son giving his blood. Gifts from both. And so Jesus again changes our idea of God as being a God who is angry and that demands somebody's got to pay. And be it, it's not the image. Not the image. It's a God who comes from immortality into the sphere of the immortal and invites all to become part of immortal existence. Jesus Christ shattered previously held images and conceptions of God. I think this is real important. We kind of glide over it. That's really what Jesus did. People looked at him and said, whoa, time. He can't be God. He's not distant and remote. He's not vengeful. That can't be. And what Jesus said, he is God. Uh, he was single-minded in his desire to cr correct misguided notions about God. And he expressed the intensity of this single-mindedness. In who he got angry at. When you think of Jesus, who did he save his greatest anger for? It wasn't those who were moral foul-ups, like us. It was those who claimed to represent God and didn't. Who said, this is what God is like and presented a picture of God that was not accurate. Now, when Jesus was given the green light to confront them, he took the table and he tipped them over. This is not my Father. This is not what he's like. That's what Jesus came to do, to correct misguided notions about what God was really like, notions held in the history of religion. And Jesus came to say, time, not true. 
Do we still hold those notions today? Yeah, that's why Jesus' ministry is still relevant. He reveals to us what God is like and what He isn't like. Jesus was gentle with the immoral who would admit it. Again, those who denied, he didn't have much for them. Those who were authentic and honest, who weren't trying to create this impression, Jesus was extremely gentle with any individual like that. Again, those who claimed to represent God, who said, I know what he's like and misrepresented them, Jesus was livid with them. And you know why? Because there's individuals who need to connect with God. That's, that's a true thing. And then here's an individual claiming that this is what God is like. Now this person, needing to connect with God, looks at and says, Holy smokes, that's God. Um, I think I'll take my business elsewhere. And what Jesus says looking on, No! That wasn't Him. That wasn't Him. That's what He came to do. To tell us who have been raised in places and have pictures about God, what Jesus wants to tell us, No! That's not Him. That's not Him. And that's what He came to reveal. He was fanatical about it. He was single-minded. And what would Jesus was single-minded is revealing the Word to His disciples. And what we'll see, revealing the Word to them and through them. And because this happened, we're in a position to believe a couple thousand years later. But his, He was single-minded about the Father revealing the Word to them. What he says in the worship folder, look at the first verse in the sheet in the worship folder. What Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means to set apart. To set apart. When God sanctifies something, he takes it and sets it apart from something and sets it apart for something. He sets it apart for God's use. That's what to sanctify means. To take someone who's not in a position to be used and to bring them into a place where they are usable. And so in the verse, it also expresses not only what, but how. So here's my question to you. Don't look at the verse. How does God sanctify a person? Hmm. Hmm. Give them religious experiences? Some have had some and claim that 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 was an important thing. Look what he says. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What he seems to say is we're set apart by God's word. Set apart by God's word. And this is consistent because what Jesus came is to reveal the truth of the Father. And what he knew is those who held this truth, became those who were usable. Doesn't that make sense? If you want to let people know about somebody, say that's your mission, to let people know about somebody, and you forget what the person is like, (laughs) it's going to be kind of hard. I I want you to know about this person. What are they like? Um, Yeah, good question. I kind of forget. Well, what did they say? Let me think. What did they say? They, what, they said something. They said something. Wait, no, don't tell me. No, they said something. You know, I'm, I'm not very effective if I am not holding knowledge of who I'm trying to let people know about. And so that's why Jesus revealed his word to them, was set apart for God's use and set apart by God's word. And it makes sense when you understand What is the threat? You know, we talk about Satan, and individuals say, Satan made me do this, and Satan made me do that. What does Satan do? If we peel Satan down to, or break it down to, what is he most invested in? What the Bible tells us is he's a liar. Okay, what does he lie about? Well, he lies about what he's always lied about. Again, we've talked about it. Remember the Garden of Eden, right? Well, not that you were there. <laughs> Anyways, bad. Garden of Eden. 
Um, God said, you won't, you, the day you eat it, you'll die. And Satan says, oh, by the way, <laughs> you won't die. Why? What's he saying? God lies. Now, he was lying. Satan was lying. But he said, God's the liar. And then he said, the reason why God doesn't want you to eat fruit from the tree is because God doesn't want you to be like him. And so what he's saying about God, God is self-serving. You can't trust God to do what's best for you because God always does what's best for himself. What's he doing? Lying. Why is he lying about? Because one who harbors wrong notions about God is going to what? Say something like this. Oh, brother, if I can't trust God to protect me, then I need to know good and evil so that I can protect myself. You understand how that works? Thoughts. Misguided thoughts about God lead to attitudes. I can't trust him. So the thought is, God isn't trustworthy. Attitude. Boy, I can't trust what he says. Action. Well, I'll take from the fruit. And so Satan, where he's invested in, is lying. And if Satan's a liar then, how do you confront lies? With truth. And that's why Jesus reveals the word, sanctify them in truth. God, help them to know what you're really like, because what's going to happen in this world, the God of this world, Jesus knows, is going to be beaten on their heads. Things about God that are not true. And Jesus says, protect them. And that's why he revealed uh, what the word, the word about what? Uh, Reveal the word to them, the word that shows the Father's heart. Look what the verse says. Jesus said, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. What's darkness? Jesus came so that no one who believes in him should stay in darkness. What is darkness? How do you know you're there? It's not talking about physical darkness, not the darkness that if we flipped all the lights off. But on a spiritual level, it's like that. What is darkness? Believing that God is superior, distant, and threatening. That's darkness. Believing that the sphere of the holy is completely separated from the sphere of the not holy. Believing that eliminating the threat from God requires doing things for God. Now, these are... But these don't really capture what God is like because Jesus came to reveal God. And you know what Jesus calls himself? Light. You know what light does? It penetrates darkness. Our thoughts about God are critical. And that's what Jesus single-mindedly came to do. To reveal the word from the Father so that we would be able to think true things about God. And we would have something with which to defend ourselves when the God of this world tells us lies. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. So, you know what that means? Our thoughts about God will say a lot about us. They'll say a lot about our ability to be used by God. Harboring wrong thoughts about God It will be very difficult for us to be used by him if he wants to reveal truth and we harbor lies. Does that make sense? It's like saying, I want you to get to know someone and then telling untruths about the person you want them to know. That's darkness. And thoughts, again, lead to attitudes and actions. Jesus shattered these notions about God. And what Philip said, show us the Father, Jesus. That's what he said to Jesus once. Show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And what Jesus said, you're looking at him. No, no, I mean the Father that you're looking at him. What Jesus said, I reflect God. Whoa, whoa, there's kind of a disconnect, Jesus. You don't look like the God I've read about. And what Jesus says, 
God has revealed himself through prophets, through law. But what Jesus said, the law is a shadow. Again, you know what a shadow is. You know, I don't know if I can make a shadow. So I'm not going to try. I can see I'm making a little dog. You know, you can make a little dog shadow. Um, and the thing about a shadow, it doesn't have facial features. You can't see its eyes. It has the form, but it's not a clear representation, is it? You know, you can, there's a shadow of me over there. You can tell some things about the shadow if you were looking at it. You could tell approximately how big I am, how tall, but you can't find, you can't learn a lot about me from looking at my shadow. The law in the Old Testament is a shadow of God. When God said, okay, now I want to show you what I'm like, Jesus showed up. And when Jesus says, show us the Father, Jesus says, this is what the Father is like. He's a God who comes down into human skin, who reaches over to those who are mortal and doesn't demand that people stand on their heads. Now, are there things that we need to do? Yeah. The most important thing we need to do is when he tells us something, especially about the character of God, we don't just hear it, we hold it. Tell you what, you can't really pass something on that you're not holding. That's what he wants us to do. That's primary. Jesus said he represented the intent and character of the Father. You know why Jesus did miracles? He did miracles so that people would believe what he said. The miracles didn't stand on their own. So what people would say, hey, time out, Jesus. How can I know that what you're saying is true when you tell us about the kingdom and about what the Father is like? And Jesus said, okay, I'll walk on water. Now, he didn't walk on water to say, oh, isn't, yay, you know, you can walk on water too. Or, you know, he raised the dead. He did all that stuff. Why? So that people would believe him. What he would say, believe me, he said to the disciples, that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the account of the miracles. What he's saying, when I tell you about the Father, believe what I'm saying. Believe it because you trust my character. Believe it because you see what I've done I don't care why you believe it. Believe it. Because why? He came to reveal the Father. And he wanted to let people know what he was like. God was referred to in a way that he was never referred to in the history of religion as we know it. You could take every religion in the world prior to Jesus. You will never find God called what Jesus taught us to call him. And what is that? Father. You will never find God revealing himself as Father. There's not a prayer in Judaism ever where anyone, David didn't say it, Abraham didn't say it, no one ever called God Father. Until Jesus came And he said, I want to show you what the Father is like and clarify the focus. He wants you to call him Father. That tells you things about him. It tells us things about him. That is the clearest representation of what he wants, what he's like. Those who believe in Jesus and who hold the word, he proclaimed, experience God as their Father. Reveal the word to them, the word that shows the father's heart and the word that grows a child's heart. Look what it says in the verse Galatians 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons, Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. There's holiness spoken of in the Bible. And in the first half of the Bible, holiness is associated with the temple and with the scriptures. In the New Testament, the scriptures are still holy, but holiness is 
is identified with the Spirit. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. Sanctify means make holy. So here's the way it works. When we come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that's how we become set apart by God. The Spirit uses the Word of God, but the Spirit is the influence that helps us to become who God wants us to be. He's the Holy Spirit. He makes us holy. Without the Spirit's influence, there is no holiness. What is the character of the Spirit's influence? And again, I think this is a really important question. Okay, if the Spirit influences us to be holy, how? What does he do? What kind of things does he want me to think? Hmm. How does the Spirit want us to think of the Father? Well, he wants us to think of him as the Father. Look what it says. God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Do you know what the Spirit wants to do in us? Duplicate in us the Spirit that was within Jesus. Jesus was in a lot of tight spots. The thing that was always consistent in him is he understood that God was his Father and cared about him. And that understanding gave Jesus tremendous courage. Knowing that the eternal God was his Father, Jesus was unstoppable. How would it affect you if you understood at a deeper level that God was real and that he was your Father? That as it relates to you, He watches over you. He's a parent in that he is sensitive to you. He's not what J.C. calls a helicopter parent, hovering. And just, you know, any, any, oh, let me get you out. Oh, you know, it's not like that. He's a good parent. Sometimes he knows we need to struggle. He's not a spaceship parent so far away that he can't respond. He's in the middle. Why? He's a great father. He's responsive. He's sensitive. He's willing. That's what the Spirit wants to help you to believe. Why? Because as you believe that, you will become holy, set apart. That's how he does it. People who are holy at this point are ones who understand that God is their Father And they think about the promises the Father makes. Because if you start to be in touch with what the Father wants, that he wants to include you in his immortal family, some of the temptations of this life become a little less forceful when you understand you're going to be with him in the next. I think that's how it works. The Spirit helps us to understand that we are children of God, and the context in which he does that is in the context of difficulties. Sometimes you hear on TV that if you are being led by the Spirit, you know, you're getting all kinds of cash in, and great things happen all the time. That's not what it says. God's power is made perfect in weakness. That's what Jesus said. So what we find, we go through some difficult things, but in the midst of those difficulties, what God says It's in the middle of difficulties that you'll learn how powerful belief in me as your father can be. Can I encourage you? How of you, when you're in difficulties, go into the default thinking, which is, okay, the gods are mad at me. (laughs) What do I need to do? I can't kill the animal. You know, family would get mad if I killed the dog. I don't have an altar anyways. So it's not killing anything, but what we say, well, I'll go to church a bunch more and make God happy. He's obviously mad at me. Or I'll do this and I'll get God off my back and call off the dogs. Or I'll do this or that and all these things. We treat God like what? We treat him like he's like the gods that Jesus came to tell us he wasn't like. He's not like that. What would happen if in the middle of difficulties, understanding that any father allows his children or disciplines his children. God's like that. He allows us to experience painful things, but what he wants us to do in the middle of that is call out to him, Father. 
give me the wisdom to go through what I'm going through. Here's a challenge. If you're in the middle of difficulty right now, rather than blow God off or curse him, what kind of, why don't you try this? Call on him. How about that? Maybe you can understand that it's not necessarily that you've done something wrong and he's beating you. In the context of difficulties, the Spirit's influence is powerful. Give it a try. Hold the word. Call out to him as Father. And what he indicates is that that's how we become set apart. I can think of times when I went through difficult things, and there are, there are periods, I can think of isolated ones that were very difficult times. I remember, and I said, God, I, I don't even know what to say. And I came from a time, I said, all I know is that I'm, I'm not in great shape and I really need to hear something. And there are times I can name them. I can tell you where I was. And if I talk about them long, I'll do this. They were very meaningful. I don't want to go through what I went through, but I tell you what, that experience, there were times that I really believe, I didn't hear voices. I don't hear voices. But I had a question, and I felt there was an answer. And I came from that thing, and I said, gosh, I'm encouraged. And even now, yeah, see, even now, I, I don't know what that is. What is that? I sensed he was my father and that he was close. Again, I didn't see him. The hair didn't stand up on the back of my neck. You know, it wasn't like that. Some of you have those, maybe those kind of things. But there was something that came to mind, tremendously powerful. I think that's what it's like. His, the influence of God as Father is the only one that can break the crushing influence of worries, riches, and pleasures. Tell you what, worries, riches, pleasures, there's only one influence that can break the stranglehold. It's an increasing ability to believe that God is your Father. Because if you believe God's your Father, you don't need to hoard a bunch of money. If God is your Father... You can trust him to deal with some of the things you worry about. If God is your father and he says, I don't want you to do this, you can say, okay, I trust that you're not just trying to say don't have fun. So worries, riches, and pleasures, all of those three are managed with an increasing sense that God is father. So what am I saying? It's the path to holiness. It is. The fear of God, being terrified of Him, will not make you holy. God does not cause individuals to be terrified of Him in order to make them holy. He does not. Otherwise, the Spirit would do that, and the Spirit doesn't. He was single minded. Jesus was reveal the word to them and reveal the word through them. Look what he says, Jesus, in this prayer that he prays, As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I think what he's doing here is Jesus says, If I stay on the cross and if I pour out my life, I can give them life. And those who believe in Christ receive that life. What is that life? The Holy Spirit comes within and begins to influence us to regard God as Father. That's what life is like. We will spend eternity in this type of life. Those who hear, believe, and hold the Word, we will spend our life eternally relating to God as Father. That can start now. You don't have to wait until you die to experience God. It can start now. What do you say? How? Hear the word. Don't just hear it. Learn to hold it. We've looked at a verse. Do you remember the verse? Very simple. Ten words. Where does it come from? Hebrews 13.5. Some of you weren't here. You'll learn a verse in the next five, ten seconds maybe. 
The first five words are, Never will I leave you. Never will I leave you. Let's say it together. One more time. And here was what leaving is. It's when, let's say, a child is in a position where there's danger around. And if I leave the child, here's what I do. Now, I'm over here with my back turned, and I have left, I've gone somewhere else. Now, that child's in danger now, because I left. And what God says, I will never go over there. That's what leaving is. Forsaking is when there's a child and a parent and the father looks and he, he stays in that place. He's there, but he forsakes. He doesn't do the things that he should do. He just decides not to. I, I don't want to. You made me mad. So I'm not going to pick. You made your bed. You sleep in it. Yeah. God will never do that either. He'll never go somewhere else. And if, when he's here, he will never go, I don't think I want to help you. Why? Because that's not his character. Now, again, he's not a helicopter. You know, just, oh, gee whiz, you skinned your knee. You know, we go through some rough stuff. But he never fails or forsakes. That's the second five words, by the way. What's the first five? He'll never go over there. And and again, the second five, never will I forsake you. What's... And the both those together, Hebrews 13, 5. And when you don't just hear that, but hold it and begin to think about it, chew on it, you know what begins to happen? You start to believe it. Today, we're exposed to so many things that we don't believe anything. We're bombarded by so many different items of information that we don't have any time to believe anything because everything's zipping into our heads so fast. You know what I just thought of? I didn't just think of it. But if I am Satan and I don't want people to believe in Jesus, you know a way I could do that? Bombard them with so much information that they can't believe in anything. They can't hold anything. And I think that's what happens. Here's my challenge. You start holding little bits of the word in your heart. And what you'll find, they will protect your notions about God. That's why Jesus revealed them. Take them up on it. One more time. What's the verse? Say the whole thing. Hebrews 13, 5. Good. Uh, Reveal the word to them. And finally, reveal the word through them. Um, Hold the word to place roots in God. What it says, the seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. But the seed on good soil stands for those who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. The default setting of this world will lead you to believe wrong things about God. And if Satan, all he has to do is do this. I'll take that. You know that thing you learned about God? Let me have that. Boom. And if he takes the word now, you will think what the world thinks in terms of religion, and you will be in the dark. That's why Satan cannot take something that you are holding. Again, don't just take some word and just kind of hold it, grab it. And this is just one of many verses. But think about this verse. And if you hold it, you can take it with you. You're in a place where you're tempted to do, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And when you're conscious of that, it'll really help you to develop a different attitude and take a different action. If you don't hold it, you got nothing. You're out there on your own. That's why his word is like a sword. Hold it. And to hold it will drive your roots into God. That's how it works. I don't think it's possible without holding the word. I don't think anyone can become a mature, fruitful, now this is not load, but just the truth, I think, without a greater familiarity with the Word. That's why every, all Sunday we'll talk about the Word all the time. Intermission is, we're gonna, we, do, we have a time for a little more questions. Can I challenge you to think of something? 
I think you probably already do. But many of us who grew up in church see coming to church as doing something for God. You know what I mean? Do something for Him. Okay, I hope you're happy. You know, I, I kind of ignore you during the week, but when you come to church, then God goes, oh, I'm glad you remembered me. <laughs> I felt really bad. I felt like I wasn't important, but now you came to church and oh, I feel better. You know, thanks for doing that for me. It, it, it meant a lot. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, the, that's the image we get. Like God is dependent on that. You know, church is not about doing something for God. It's about receiving something from Him. What? Truth. Truth is protective. So I want you to see that. And maybe you can... So you receive something this morning. That's what church is about, not doing something. Receiving. Serving, it can be. There's other things we do. Take advantage of those. Um, hold the word to produce fruit for God. Last verse, look what it says. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If you keep Jesus' words in your heart and again, listen, but think about them. And we'll help. This summer we're going to memorize some more verses. Um, what it, it's not just going to benefit you, it's going to benefit others. Because here's what he says. If you remain in me, my words remain in you, here's what you can do. You can ask me, and what you ask I'll give you. Now, what if you were concerned about somebody, you cared about them? It seems like they're in the dark, they feel very alone. And you keep God's words in your heart, and you say, God, I know you're with me, and I'm concerned for that person. Would you be with them? Would you show yourself to them and help them to be in the light and know the truth? What Jesus says, I'll do that. So, worship team, come on up. We're going to close with a song. Here's three things. Know the Father by holding His Word. It's a process. It's not perfection. It's progress. Know the Father by holding His Word. That's first. Primary. Then... Talk to the Father about people you care for. And the thing you want to ask is that they might know Him too. Talk to the Father about people you care for. Then, talk to people you care for about the Father. I think that's the order. Know God by holding His Word. Talk to the Father about people you care for. Then, talk to people you care for about the Father. And He'll reveal Himself to them. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for being who you are and for caring enough about communicating that, that you would send your son so that we might have you revealed accurately. Thanks that he gave us words, taught us things, words that we can think about and reflect on that help us to believe true things about you, true thoughts that lead to good attitudes and good actions, thoughts that help us to overcome bad thoughts leading to bad attitudes, bad actions. I'd ask that you continue to help us to be the people you want us to be. Sanctify us. Set us apart. Put the truth deep in our heart. For Christ's sake. Amen.